I'm Lorenzo Cano, the Associate Director at the Center for Mexican American Studies, and um, I'm here at the University of Houston. And um, I'm, of course, I was here in Houston uh, during the uh, murder of Jose Campos Torres and was part of a, a coalition of community people and organizations uh, that uh, fought to try to get justice uh, as a result of the murder um, of this young uh, man. But um, let me first uh, start off by saying that um, the, the killing of Jose Campos Torres uh, is only one of a long line of killings uh, by police departments against people of Mexican descent in the United States for many years, going back uh, to the time when Texas became part of the United States. Uh, if one looks at what happened in the late 1970s with Jose Campos Torres, uh, and one that uh, knows this history will very quickly think about the killings of people of Mexican descent in and around 1915 in South Texas and along the U.S.-Mexico border. This is when we see the Texas Rangers in particular, in particularly, uh, uh, fighting uh, against Mexicans who they claimed to be bandits, but oftentimes they were just innocent people, and who basically took the law in their own hands. Uh, these uh, so-called special rangers uh, killed, uh, according to some people, up between 5,000 to 15,000 uh, Mexican Americans and Mexicanos uh, along that area in and around the years of 1915. Uh, but this happens um, in our community for many, many years after that, before that and after that. The Jose Campos Torres case is particularly um, uh, very interesting and a very unfortunate and sad event in our history because it killed a young man that had so much potential. Uh, he killed somebody uh, by law enforcement officials, those individuals that uh, we usually think are here to protect us. And in this case, you had several law enforcement uh, officers uh, who beat him up, uh, tied him up, and then threw him in the bayou uh, where he drowned. And um, they tried to hide this history, and the police department itself, of course, uh, were slow to react to these killings, and the judicial system itself, of course, failed this community. And um, the, I think that the, his killing, and, and especially the tragic manner in, 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 in the manner that he was uh, murdered, uh, really resonated throughout the community because uh, in our collective memory as people of Mexican descent, our parents and our grandparents told us the stories of this type of abuse against uh, many members of the community. So. Um, uh, uh, just thinking back, um, you know, this was just a terrible time, but it was also a time of resistance when the people organized, myself included, to speak out against these injustices uh, because we knew that if we didn't, then certainly um, uh, these things would continue on a more frequent basis. I, um, I was not present uh, during the conflict when the police officers arrested uh, a young man or a couple of young men who apparently had a disagreement in the bathroom. Uh, I was there uh, throughout most of the day, and this was a, a Cinco de Mayo celebration uh, at Moody Park. And I had attended these celebrations before in the past. This particular celebration, uh, in my, when I was there, I noticed that there were a lot more people uh, and there was just a lot of people that pretty much reflected the composition of the community. That is to say that we had young people, children with families, uh, we had teenagers, high school students, we had college students there. There were uh, the elderly uh, were, were there as well. You had many, many people from different backgrounds uh, that were there at the park. Uh, as a matter of fact, I recall there was a group of Asians uh, that were also there at the park enjoying uh, the festivities of the Cinco de Mayo. But the park was, um, uh, was, was uh, I'm not going to say it was packed, but the, the park was full during the time that I was there. And um, uh, so I did leave the park uh, in the late afternoon and went home. And um, the next morning when I got up, uh, this is when I realized uh, that uh, this had gone on in the park. I would say that I did notice that there were, uh, you know, police officers there in the park. I didn't think that that was, you know, particularly a negative thing, in the sense that you always have law enforcement, uh, you know, at some of these some of these public um, events. Um, but 
I couldn't feel that there was this animosity to an extent towards the police department because, um, you know, just just because of the of the the history of the police department in the barrios uh, in in Houston and in particularly in the near north side and Segundo Barrio and many of these these communities, but. Um, but the the confrontations with the police department at the park uh, did catch me off guard, and, but I was not surprised. You know, I mean, I was surprised it was that it had happened because I had been there throughout most of the day, uh, and I left uh, and uh, went home. This was that uh, the time of the internet. Internet was not. Uh, here at that time and and uh, most of the time you woke up and you got the news the next day and this is what uh, I discovered and um, yeah so so to me I was not surprised by the reaction of the community the community uh, that uh, defended its interest in the park perhaps symbolically against the uh, police officers and um, so I knew right away that this was going to continue being um, there was co co there was going to continue being all types of organizing uh, because of Jose Campos Torres himself. You know this this uh, uh, the the spark the actual spark that led to the conflict between the police and the community uh, might have been some type of confrontation by two individuals in a restroom or whatnot. But I knew that there had already been growing in the community this uh, this this negative sentiment against the way the community was treated by law enforcement. Well, one of the consequences, uh, I think, is the, the, the naming of the first, uh, let's say, African-American uh, police chief uh, in the Houston Police Department. Um, the Houston Police Department trying to integrate uh, its police force, you know, the, the increase in the numbers of African-American, of Mexican-American um, police officers in the police department. Um, I think this has uh, improved things to a certain extent uh, in that you have more uh, diversity within the Houston Police Department and um, the, the police department itself um, continued to uh, teach some of their officers Spanish so that they would be able to communicate with let's say non-English speakers uh, in the in the neighborhoods um, and so they, they, we see the establishment or growth of what we call sensis, sensitivity training to the police department uh, and things along those lines um, but in terms of the treatment of, of the police department with uh, especially young people in our community, not only young but primarily young people in our community, uh, I think uh, we continue to have many problems uh, in many of the barrios and many of the neighborhoods um, here in Houston, Texas and in the surrounding areas. Although we have um, probably quite a few police officers that uh, treat people fairly, uh, do not talk down to people, do not threaten to people unnecessarily. I think that you still have that mentality among a lot of police officers uh, who uh, mistreat people, talk to them in a very negative way, and, uh, and, um, and are, are quick to use you know, their firearms um, against people when it's not necessary to do so. So I, I think that uh, although things, I think, have gotten a little bit better in terms of how the institution has diversified the Houston Police Department, that we still continue seeing these types of things uh, here in Houston. And these things still have to be addressed. So I think that we really need a, a true civilian review board that could um, investigate uh, when there are allegations of uh, abuse against the police department and, and not, not one that they claim to have, you know, where they're made up by police officers themselves or appointed by the friends of police officers, but one that is truly independent. And uh, even if it could reflect just the, the composition of the community itself, that would be great. Uh, and and uh, because then I think we would have more accountability on the part of the police department itself. Uh, there is just now some talk about having uh, uh, cameras that police department that police individual policemen can wear. Uh, I think the jury is still out, out on that, but I think that um, uh, because of the recent killings and that we, that we've seen in other states uh, and, and in recent days, actually, uh, that uh, this is something to consider as well. Uh, I think that uh, we need to go and move towards more of a community policing 
uh, type of system where the police can uh, perhaps could consider living in the communities where where they patrol. Uh, I, perhaps having the police department uh, riding by, more bicycles in the community where they live, getting to know the people in that community, I think would be a more um, I think would be a more effective way of policing to begin with. Well, you know, instit <coughs> institutions like these uh, never want to admit wrongdoing. Um, sometimes it's because they don't want to be sued for uh, under, under, under civil law, uh, where they feel they would have to give up compensation to individuals. It's hard for me to say why they haven't done this, and it's been so many years now. But I think it's just the, 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 uh, a general outlook that institutions like law enforcement have. They just simply cannot admit that they were wrong. Because to admit that they were wrong, I think, uh, will pick at their legitimacy uh, as an institution in, in our cities today. And now with the policemen who are now much better equipped, especially with almost military gear and weapons and, and technology, uh, and as we see the uh, wage gap grow uh, in, our, in our cities, especially among those who are at the lower end of the economic scale versus those who have more money, you're going to see more conflict between the various classes of people and also uh, um, among different ethnic and racial minority groups still, as we have seen for many, many decades uh, in this country. Uh, so. There, there, there is more conflict now, um, especially when we see some of the individual, individuals trying to organize labor unions. A lot, uh, many, uh, many of these attempts um, are within the Latino and African American community. Uh, so the police are there to protect the interest of those uh, who have the power in society for the most part, in my opinion. The, I think still our police department, like many police departments, just in just different parts of the world, their main goal, I think, is just to maintain the social order. Uh, so that dissent, for example, among, let's say, uh, uh, union members or students who are walking out of the high schools or the public schools, as we observed just a couple of two or three years ago, where the police intervened when they should not have intervened, uh, is a good case in point of what I'm trying to say. Uh, you know, after the some of the student walkouts here because of the immigration issue, uh, the Houston, some police departments used some restraint, but uh, it was clear cut by even the, in the mainstream media here how they arrested and harassed a lot of young kids who were walking out. Well, this was not legal. They, they violated their constitutional rights. And some, some courts uh, shortly thereafter indicated they, these kids had a constitutional right to leave the school if they were going to a legitimate protest um, uh, that was under the Constitution. And so these are the kind of examples that I'm talking about. Uh, the abuse of uh, union workers, many of them females, downtown Houston, who are stepped on by horses. Uh, when they're committing civil disobedience, you know, a, a horse stepping on you is, is, can, can kill you, actually, and can certainly maim you for life. Uh, so these are the kind of things that I'm talking about by the police department maintaining the social order. Uh, and this is in addition to, as I said, just uh, the nightly uh, policing of, of, of uh, law enforcement in our communities. So, um, I think another good example is the, the, um, the war on drugs against um, uh, here in this country and how that war on drugs is by basically in minority communities. Latino communities, African American working class, lower class communities, um, they are the ones that are arrested more often by police departments, although a lot of the research has indicated that a lot of, most people, there, there's just as many people in the Anglo community and, uh, and middle class communities who are abusing drugs. Um, uh, so this is another example of how the, the police themselves from an institutional perspective and in the manner that they have been deployed in our society uh, really works against the interests of the uh, Mexican community in the United States. Our community, the Mexican community and the broader Latino community is a relatively youthful community, a young community. and and. Um, the police department uh, has an intimate role to play on the future of these young kids. Um, you know, young kids in our community, um, many of them do not own automobiles. Um, uh, many of them uh, walk and police patrol on the streets. So it is a natural sort of, I guess, uh, reality that you have the police department patrolling along the streets, the same streets where we see a, a lot of our youth walking. and. 
this uh, sociologically, I think, is, is an important thing to understand that uh, police patrol, uh, but for the mo but the average day of a policeman is very boring. Um, this is what the research shows that police have been interviewed. You know, what we see on TV is just happens every once in a while. But on the average, a uh, uh, Houston police department uh, police is is driving around boring. And uh, if you do this day after day and nothing is happening, you get bored. So that any time they see our youth walking along the streets, oftentimes I think they, they, they decide, well, let's, let's see what's going on because they're just bored. And then that often leads to a confrontation. Uh, our young kids um, uh, oftentimes um, defend their rights vocally and they want to know why they're being stopped. And uh, some people criticize this, and, and, uh, and others look at it from the point of view that, well, uh, maybe they shouldn't just so they'll be protected because they don't know that what could happen to them. But in reality, they have a right to question why they're being stopped. And it's this questioning of the police department, the questioning um, of, of the police themselves that often irks individual police officers because they feel that they're police officers that, that they should be respected totally. Maybe that should be the case, but under our Constitution, we have a right to question. And this is part of the freedom, supposedly, that we have in this country. So a lot of our youth uh, who question these usually find themselves getting arrested <laughs> because they then uh, are searched. Uh, and, and of course, when they, if they resist because they feel it's unfair, then of course they're resisting arrest, and pretty soon they're in juvenile hall, right? So. Uh, for the youth today, I think we need to, they need to be very clear and they need to know the consequences of their actions. At the same time, they also need to know that they do have these rights and they do need to know how to, uh, what to say and what not to say when they are uh, arrested unnecessarily so, so that they won't place additional charges on them. But uh, it is, these are the little confrontations that lead to the killing of young people in the community. Uh, it's not because they're necessarily committing a crime or that they themselves are attacking the police. Oftentimes uh, police killings will happen in these types of incidents. Just like when uh, many uh, Mexican Americans will get stopped for a routine traffic stop. You know, um, it's more often than times it's our cars that are searched. More often than times they'll ask us if we are here legally, if we are U.S. citizens, and this is not asked of the middle class people that live uh, in River Oaks or in some of the upper class neighborhoods. And now, if they would ask everybody, and everybody was treated the same, and if everybody, uh, you know, was treated with respect, that's okay. But it's just much easier to target uh, young, uh, poor minority group members uh, from, uh, that live here in the city of Houston.